Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Leadership Book of the Month. This is our 12th one. So happy anniversary, Brett and Dave. Thank you. Yes, fantastic. Can you believe it? This seems like only yesterday and time has flown right by. <laughs> it sounds cliche, but that's so accurate. You couldn't be more, more on point. And uh, plus all the other books we read in, in addition to the ones that we get to talk about each month with everyone. So when um, we started this last year, after Brett and I had talked several times about reading the same books and um, extensive lists of books, and uh, I had had a couple conversations and had uh, facilitated by myself a few different um, leadership book of the month. Uh, they weren't consistent every month, but had done a couple and uh, brought in uh, Dave uh, was, was a student at Rockhurst and then I mean uh, Brett is a student and then Dave joined a couple months later as a professor from Rockhurst so the Rockhurst connection brought us together and the, the uh, love of continued learning and uh, Brett kind of synthesized our purpose is to inspire leaders of tomorrow to invest in their development today and man, that ties into today's book, but I'm going to hold off on that for a minute. And uh, Dave, uh, or I mean, Brett, I'll invite you first. Do you want to share um, something key from the last year, a takeaway or anything, uh, a lesson or what was your favorite or anything from the last year? You know, there were a couple, actually. I mean, the first was, you know, networking with both of you helped me read better material. I mean, granted, I can find good material, but it's always great to kind of have that, what, what Dr. Shildani called social proof, right? Being yeah. able to, to bounce thing off uh, of peers and, and, and associates and really look for good content. So I really felt like I read better material that was more on point and more applicable to things that I wanted to do and learn and develop by networking with you folks. So that you know, kudos to both of you because I'm better for knowing you. And then I think secondly, just staying in the habit, right? We talk a lot mm -hmm. about developing good habits of, of personal development, sharpen the edge, you know, whatever cliche you like to use. And, and just, you know, obviously having this responsibility and being accountable to doing the broadcast every month. Yeah, you got to read. And as Kelly pointed out, you know, these weren't the only books we read. I mean, oftentimes I'd be juggling two or three books just because there were other there was other material that I wanted to get get to and learn about and consume. So, uh, you know, that accountability piece was key for me because let's be honest, had I not had both of you inspiring me through this process, maybe I wouldn't have read as many books. So uh, it's not the number, of course, quantity versus quality, right. but the quality of books that I was able to uh, consume and digest is was top notch this year and, you know, looking forward to a second year and beyond. So thank you to both yeah. of you. Yeah. Thank you too. And I think something about that accountability, because we never canceled any, we never, no, we, we didn't, never, we didn't miss know, a we're all busy. So, you know, there were times that we were maybe coming in at three forty or three fifty eight, but we were ready to go. Exactly. Um, Dave, what about you? Yeah, I would I would really echo that accountability concept is, you know, we I always know that as we re reach the end of the month, it's like, OK, 15th of the month, pulse check. Where am I? Have I dove into the book yet? And uh, it, it has kind of helped me to change conversations. I have with leaders and kind of a great conversation starter is always read anything good lately. Ah. Uh, you know, as, as you guys have mentioned, we, we all deal with this. We have the same amount of time every week. And for me, it's a major letdown to grab a book that um, I don't enjoy and to get so far into it and go, okay, I'm halfway into this book. It still hasn't grabbed me. Is this one going to grab me late? Uh, or am I wasting my time? Do I pull the plug? And when you get to find those like-minded people, um, you know, there, there's definitely people I respect their book recommendations more than others. Not that they're a lesser person, but they just have different tastes and a different appetite uh, than I do. So, yeah, I, I definitely like the the accountability, being able to talk to like-minded people and understand what they're reading and know that, uh, you know, you guys haven't missed yet a book that you've recommended. I, I always uh, seem to enjoy. So it's been uh, really enjoyable for me as well. And, and we do talk about some other books that we read that we don't recommend. So yeah. part we don't want to, you know, have a spend time with the listeners and the viewers and have you read something and then we sit here and talk about it and we didn't like it for half an hour. And uh, we've had different views on some of the books and different takes and that's been fun. Um, one of my takeaways is the, um, you know, as much as we've we all read and I have for a long time, I've studied leadership and all of this um, really since high school, I've started, I started my library, but it just um, never ceases to amaze me that there's always room to grow. Mm -hmm. Like, am I ever going to just like go, Oh, I knew everything in that book. <laughs> I have not ever had that. So I think that 
that it's really fun that there's always something to learn or a nuance of perspective. And uh, I've really liked that. I'm like, what is this person going to say? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, that's been really good. So thank you to everyone that's been along for our journey. We appreciate you. And we talk about you in our pregames to make sure that we are meeting the responsibility to um, help you with your leadership development. So if you're not reading all of the books that you're at least getting some uh, leadership development by spending some time with us and we appreciate you and, and we remain dedicated to that. So today's book um, is the prettiest of the books that we read this year, right? The Five Graces of Life and Leadership. And um, this came to my attention from uh, Gary Bernison as the CEO of Corn Ferry and sends an email out. And I think, Brett, you um, brought that email to my attention um, middle of last year or late last year. And then this was one of the, um, when it came out in December last year, um, they advertised it, but it, it really is a coffee table book at my house. Like I keep it, keep it on the coffee table and it was all I could do to not write in it. So I have the little flags instead, but that's what will be on my coffee table. Um, so Brett, I'll invite you to do the um, introduction and share Gary, if you would um, tell the group about Gary, the author. Good. If you can, I throw two bullet points in there first. Yeah, of course. Great. And I, in, in previous conversations, you know, I've talked a little bit about bucket lists and doing things and setting goals and life planning. And I, I think I spoke a couple of call, or conversations ago about my friend who kayaked the Mississippi from its origin in Minnesota all the way to Louisiana. And he came to our, our lake cabin here the, earlier this spring, and literally the entire weekend was consumed by hearing his experience. And, and I was just so moved by hearing that. I just said, you know what? 12 months is going to go by and I'm not going to have anything to contribute, nothing to add. I said, I, I need to get moving. I need to do something. And, and so I sat down with my wife and I said, you know, we, need, we don't need to spend our entire life savings, but there's a lot of things that we can do that are noteworthy, that are inspiring, that, you know, kind of get your blood boiling and, and, they're, and they're memorable. So one of ours was to put our bikes in my truck and go to Chicago when we had this kind of vision of biking up and down Lakeshore Drive. Uh, mm. They call it, it's called a Lakefront Trail and you can pick it up, you know, right there in downtown Chicago and it's 18 miles from end to end. So we did that this weekend. Oh, and, uh, yeah. yeah, it was, it was fantastic. I, 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 and it didn't cost, you know, other than the gas and the hotel room, it didn't really cost anything, which uh, again, I think people naturally say, well, I don't have a lot of money. I really can't do anything remarkable. Mm -hmm. And I call BS on that. You know, you can do a lot of remarkable yeah. things that don't require a ton of money. And I think there's something to be said for appreciating nature and sunrises. And But we just had a wonderful, wonderful time. We caught the leaves at exactly the right time. And we caught, you know, Chicago weather in October was in the mid 70s. So we biked one day, uh, eight miles up and eight miles back, which was 16. And then the other day we went uh, 10 miles, which we went tip to tip. So 20 miles one day and 16 the other. So I'm blessed that I have a, a life partner, my wife, that happens to enjoy long walks and biking just like I do. And we'll walk 10 to 15 miles and, you know, she can bike about 20, 25 and, you know, I'll occasionally do, you know, 60, 70 or 80, but we enjoy that together. So, you know, there's a lot of lessons woven into that thing. I won't, you know, wow. remember all you yeah. can all up, but, you know, the thing that I kept thinking of as I was prepping was, you know, the earned life from Marshall Goldsmith, mm -hmm. you know, live your best life, you know, yeah. and it, it starts, I believe, with just simply setting, setting a plan. And, and yeah. again, it doesn't take a lot of money. Just get out, enjoy nature, enjoy the outdoors, get moving, do something that, you know what, if you were in a conversation with somebody and they said, hey, what's going on? What would you have that would be noteworthy or worthwhile to share? And you know what? Get out of the house. I would say great things happen when you're outdoors. So that was the first thing I wanted to share. That's fantastic. This, yeah, the and, the uh, second thing, which I just, just a second. So you, mentioned, you mentioned the earned life. I'll have news yeah. about that next month. Right. We, we talked about that book in August. So more to come on that. I so, love it. And I know yeah. I know where you're going with that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the second thing, and this is the coolest part, right? As I, I, we talk a lot about mentoring and, and mentoring is a key component of really some of my little, I call them rockers, TED Talks, but this idea of networking and social interaction and, and community. And, and, and I was kind of making this up in my head saying, hey, my daughters are now 21 and 23. So I'm not really uh, parenting them anymore. I'm more mentoring them. And I don't know if that's really accurate or not, but that's kind of how I view it in my mind. And I'm constantly encouraging them to, you know, 
get comfortable being uncomfortable. So my oldest daughter works in information security, and she joined a group here called the Women in InfoSec, which is a local Kansas City chapter of information security. And she went to her first meeting here a month ago, and she's texting me, you know, before the meeting starts, Dad, I don't know anybody. What should I do? And Aww. I'm literally coaching her saying, you know, go up and introduce yourself. You know, you won't know anybody till you do. And everybody that you meet will be one more person in your community and your network. Yeah. So she got through the event, loved it, came home, you know, recap the entire thing with me. And, you know, you would think that would be the end of the conversation. So the next day at her work, she has a, what I call a stand-up meeting or a water cooler meeting, whatever you want to call it. And hey, what's going on in your life? And she shares the keynote speaker, I think, was the director of information security or VP from H&R Block. And everybody in her stand-up knew this guy. And uh, I, I, so I told her, I said, here you get this residual benefit of going to this meeting to network and develop yeah. relationships. And now all of a sudden you're the focal point of your stand-up because you were the only one in your group who got uncomfortable, demonstrated initiative, went out and built wow. your community. And she just looked at me. She said, you know, it was one of those those parent child moments where, yeah, I'm, I'm being a dad. But she said she didn't want to say you're right, but you knew under her breath, she was saying, <laughs> you're so right, dad. But I was so, so proud of her. But it just demonstrated all the points that we, you know, really hit on all the time mm -hmm. about community and networking and uh, and building that community of, of associates. So two great stories and they kind of right. illustrate so many of the concepts that we talked about. And then, yeah. you know, as, as we always talk about, we're, we're kind of putting those things into action. We don't just talk about them as a consultant or as a speaker. We try to live that life ourselves. And, and that was kind of my point there. Yeah. So I'll take a pause here. I talked a little bit, let Dave and Kelly catch up, and then I'll make the introduction for Dr. for Gary Bernison. Dave, Dave, do you have an update or anything you want to share? No, we're just continuing to churn through the semester. Um, you know, again, I, I keep saying we keep trying to find our new normal. You know, it's like most things are kind of back in person now. We're seeing a lot more stuff uh, uh, go that way, but still have a pretty strong presence on online as well. So uh, I find myself trying to figure out, um, you know, more time in the car now than I've had in the last two and a half years. So actually mm -hmm. with this book, what I did, uh, my first pass through was uh, I bought the book on Audible and actually listened to it um, behind the wheel. So um, if you're one of those that's kind of struggling to carve out the time to, to read, obviously actually looking at the words and reading clearly has has, has benefit to it um, over listening to the audio. But um, you know, most of us are spending some amount of time in the car in most cases every day. So um, I found this a great way to kind of churn through uh, even more. So if you haven't tried, it's definitely worthwhile. Oh, good. Thank you so much for that. Thank you. How are you, Kelly? Do you have an update to share? Um, not really any updates. Um, I was going to mention that I'm speaking at Global Entrepreneur Week in two weeks and um, on spirituality and bringing your spiritual values into your business. So uh, that's going to be the topic. I mentioned last time that I kind of put a stake in the ground about um, purpose and principles and um, and people as a, um, um, to, leading to performance. And so um, then this talk was approved. And so I'm um, leading and Global Entrepreneur Week is my favorite week of the year. So David, do you go to some of them? Have you been ever? I actually haven't been to that one, no. Oh, it's so good. And it's all over the city this year. Oh, so wow. um, there's several different locations. I think there might be some virtual sessions, but mine will be in person. And um, I pro pro uh, posted it today all over LinkedIn. And um, I think I even put it on Twitter and Facebook. So um, information will be there. But the spiritual um, spiritual values and leadership is um, coming up more and more. So I'm uh, delving into that and bringing that forth. So that's my update. Right. Well, congratulations and best yes. of luck. I know there's always a lot of anticipation and anxiety that goes along with it, but channel that into your positive energy yeah. and uh, knock them dead. That's fantastic. Right on. Yeah. yeah, thanks. So let's dive in here. So as Kelly said, I, I don't know how I picked up this Gary Burnison email, but he, he sends out an email generally there on Sundays about every other week and they're they're Usually, they're always about leadership, you know, what's going on in his life, what's going on in his organization. And I subscribed to him. Uh, there was one that hit me, and I don't remember exactly which one it was. Uh, opportunity and preparation, I think, was the one. And, and I responded to him, and I just said, hey, you know, this is spot on. And I, I do a lot of reading and speaking. And ironically, he responded. And uh, I thought, you know, there was probably some secretary or something that got this email. But, I mean, you could tell it was a very personalized 
email response. And I've just kind of become a Gary Burdison fan ever since. So as Kelly mentioned, he, one of those emails, he mentioned this book and I didn't really know what it was or, or what to look for, but you know what? I thought I, I follow him on email. Like how bad can it be? So I bought it and uh, started to get into it. So Gary Burdison is, as I think everybody's figured out now, is the CEO of Corn Ferry. Corn Ferry is a professional consulting organization, global in scope, about 7,500 employees. And he's actually authored now uh, seven books, one of which made the uh, the New York Times bestseller list. So what really makes uh, Gary and I click, I mean, I sound like we have a personal relationship, right? Uh, he's from Kansas, of all things. Of all and, places. Yeah, of all places, he's from Kansas. And for those of you who may be listening from a, a distant location, you know, we're all based in uh, Kansas City. But Gary Bernson grew up in rural Kansas and from very, very humble beginnings. And he talks about that extensively in his book and, and all the lessons that he learned from uh, from how he grew up and, and you know, from having some difficulties with his family finances and such. But uh, and those lessons even stay with him today. And he articulates many of those in the book. So mm -hmm. the, the book, The Five Graces, is each letter of grace represents what he calls one of the five graces. G is gratitude. R is resilience, A is aspiration, C is courage, and E is empathy. So each book I read, I kind of categorize them and say, was this a communication book? Was it a leadership book? Was it strategic thinking? And, and I've got a group of books that really don't fit any one of those categories. And I call them reflective. And, right. and that's kind of how this book uh, hit me was just each little part of the book caused me to reflect. And as you sit down and read a book, often you want to just, you go from beginning to end and you kind of even you'll consume multiple chapters. You know, some authors do a good job of breaking up themes and concepts within chapters. This is one where you almost had to read it two pages at a time. And each two page section was a story. And, yeah. and if you read four of them, you really didn't get the opportunity to reflect. But if you read just the story on those two pages and put the book down and then kind of stepped back and said, no, what does that mean to me? You really kind of got the essence of what the author was trying to communicate. So I'll pause there. That's kind of how I read it the first time. I, I didn't read it cover to cover for months until we picked it. And uh, so it was just on my coffee table. I pick it up because it's so pretty and look at the pictures and and uh, read a few pages and put it back down. And yeah, I loved it. Yeah, I disagreed with him about three things. So when we get through it, I'll I'll uh, point those out. But but I did love the book and it will go back on my coffee table. I'll be dang. <laughs> Dave, what about you? You know, I, I actually covered the book uh, the exact opposite. I had a really long drive and I listened. I, I thought he was such a good storyteller. And, you know, to Brett's point, you know, talking about growing up in, in Western Kansas, I, I did not grow up in Western Kansas. I grew up in Kansas, but I had the opportunity to attend college in Manhattan, Kansas. So a lot of my, my friends and relationships I made were from Western Kansas. So mm -hmm. When he talked about, um, you know, going to Hutchinson, Kansas, to the salt mine and yeah. all that stuff, all places I've been. And I just I, I thought he was just a wonderful storyteller. So, yeah, I covered the entire book in one long car drive. Yeah. And then, then I went back and I thought, wow, there was really a lot going on there. And uh, I actually ended up listening to it two more times oh, and wow. then picked up the the uh, the physical copy and, and went through it a couple more times. So, yeah, just a wow. really good storyteller. So I really, really enjoyed how he, uh, you know, put stories to everything. And I felt I was able to really connect with some of those, which I really enjoyed. Oh, that's so good. So do you, well, think his emails, do you, go, get, you should reach out ahead. to him with his emails and let him know that. Yeah, no kidding. I yeah, because he'll, he'll likely respond. So yeah. my experience was just a little bit different. I read the first story. And again, going back to that theme of mentoring and parenting, and I thought, I, I've got my youngest daughter still in college, and she's definitely an overachiever. And, and the first one was gratitude. And I thought, you know what, I should share this. And I, and I don't know why, but I typed out literally the entire two pages, which if, for those of you who haven't read the book, I mean, they're not really dense in terms of text. Yeah. You know, the font is large. So it wasn't all that, you know, cumbersome or much of a burden. And then at the end, I put a little reflection, you know, a couple, two, three uh, paragraphs about how, how I viewed that and how it related to me or her or something that happened to us. And I, I hit send and she sent me back an email and she said, Dad, that was really good. And, and I did it again. I did it again. We covered the entire book that way. Ah, I, 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 I swear we that. did. Yeah, we the whole book. 
And so I would get on a roll and I would read a story, two pages, and I would do my little thing. And then Outlook, you know, has that options for delivery. You delay them. And so I didn't want to send her four emails at a time. So I would space them out every other day. And uh, literally, we got to the last page and I said, believe it or not, her name's Allie. I said, Allie, you read the entire book one email at a time. And she told me she had saved every email that I said. And she said, you know, I may put these in a book and uh, show these at your funeral someday. And I said, well, wow. let's hope that's way off in the, in the distance. But, uh, and, and the funny part about, How about it was- How about your 80th birthday party or something? Yeah, there you go, that'd be better. But I, I said, uh, you know, because I, I was very vulnerable. I was very transparent. I, uh, I don't know what word we want to use, but much like how Bernison did this with his readers, I was that way with my daughter in my comments. And I told her that through this little exercise that we went through, she came to know me at a level that she never would have had we not gone this route. So, uh, you know, kind of an interesting daddy daughter thing that I'm sure we'll talk about for many years to come. So, and and now she's in therapy, or she's still talking to you? <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not in therapy, Kelly. Yeah. So let, let's dive in here. Our first, we're going to be here all day, but this is so much fun. I have a lot if you're watching, uh, send us a note because we can see your comments if you post yeah, on LinkedIn. Exactly. We can't, we can't comment to you, but we can see them if you comment. So let us right. know if you're if you happen to be joining us. So all right, let's dive in. Okay. So, so um, the first one's Grace. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. He talks about grace. And uh, one thing I liked was the paradox of leadership when he just talked about it in general with grace, how leadership starts with you. It starts with one person, but but it's not about you. So I think that's confusing to people. You know, that's confusing to Definitely. new leaders and any leader that was trained by people from the 70s and 80s. You know, that's yeah. kind of confusing. Do you want to add anything on grace or should we go into gratitude? You know, I, I had two points that I wrote down in grace and, okay. and actually three. The first one, he made a, a significant point about how we make others feel. And I remember specifically about my conversation with Allie is, hey, it's not what we do or people will quickly re- forget what you do, but they will long remember how you made them feel. Mm-hmm. And, and that's a very I've heard that before. So Wasn't that, that was Maya? Really new. Is that Maya Angelou that said that? It might have been, yeah, but he quoted that. And then, yeah. in a, and this is a John, a John Kennedy quote, but he had, everyone can do something, but no one can do everything. I think that was a paraphrase of that, which I really like that, and I've used that myself. And then he, he, made, he had several stories about staying in motion, whether that's learning or development or, yeah. you know, anything, but this idea of staying in motion, pausing for reflection, and then get moving again. And those were kind of the three points that I took out of the stories that he had under grace. Yeah, love it. Okay. What about gratitude? Dave, why don't you kick us off with gratitude? What were your thoughts on that one? Yeah. You know, when, uh, when I, I got to this, this portion of the book, um, you know, it, it reminded me of kind of my constant reminder, you know, as again, I thought that he was a really great storyteller and he was talking about, you know, growing up poor as a child and some of kind of his narrative there. And, um, you know, what? it's easy to kind of lose that gratitude sometimes, I think. I know for me, and when I was uh, in, in college, one thing I did to keep myself in college and help generate some income was every summer I'd come home from college and I'd work on my uh, best friend's dad's construction crew oh. out in the heat of summer, um, you know, July, August heat, swinging a hammer, you know, sweating wow. to death. And I, the thing that kept motivating me was, all right, you know, get back to school you know, get the degree and, and move forward. And I, I never forgot those years that I did that work and how hard it was and how physically demanding it was on my body and how I was just constantly hot all the time <laughs> the entire summer. And, uh, you know, I, I reflect back on that all the time when, uh, you know, things get, you know, less fun at work. Maybe I've got to write a report I don't want to do or go to a boring meeting. I go, okay, remember, this is what you wanted tw- over 20 uh, years ago. You wanted a job where you sat in front of a computer. Mm-hmm. In air conditioning. Work. Yeah, you didn't have to work out in the elements and, and all that. So, you know, it, it, you know, for me, that's what gratitude is, is appreciating, mm-hmm. you know, where I am and what I don't have to do anymore. Um, that said, one thing I, I won't do anymore is I, I told my wife this when we got married is I will never be hot again. So I don't care what the air conditioning bill is. I will pay <laughs> it no matter what. And, and kind of grow, growing up, not, you know, very wealthy. 
my mom was a micromanager of the thermostat. And, you know, uh, in the summer, my sister and I were constantly complaining. It's so hot in the house and in the, in the winter. Oh, it's so cold in here. And my mom's famous line always was, when you own a house and you pay the bills, you put the thermostat on whatever you want. Okay. So when I bought my first home, invited the parents over. It was in the middle of summer. I put the thermostat on 62 degrees. Oh my. And uh, it, my mom is sitting in the house just shivering. In the yeah. Of the <laughs> and she goes, Dave, it's cold in here. And I said, well, I remember over 10 <laughs> years ago, you told me when I had my own house and I paid the bill, I put the thermostat on whatever uh, I want. So we got a good laugh out of that. <laughs> and so mom, you can put yours on whatever you want, but at That's my right. house, bring a sweater. <laughs> That's, right. That's, right. That's hilarious. <laughs> That's really funny. Oh, that's so good. I love the memory though. And that, um, this is what I was, this is what I wished for. You know? yep. So yeah, I like that a lot. Um, Brett, what was your thought on gratitude? You know, much the similar. I, I worked extremely hard and had, you know, jobs as a teenager. And then, you know, contrary to what the traditional path is for senior executives going to college and then running into the business world, I got my degrees late in life. So you can imagine how hard I worked in early in my life uh, mm -hmm. with manual labor jobs, factory jobs, uh, you know, working around livestock and things of that nature. So I'm extremely, extremely gra grateful. And much like Dave, you know, here I am now, what I consider to be at the pinnacle of success and, uh, you know, blessed beyond uh, so many dreams with family and finances and things like that. And, uh, but I often remember to where it all started and where it came from. The, the part that, that really kind of resonated with me as I was reading though, is, is, you know, you can have two people at that point. And I'm sure Dave remembers the people that worked on that construction crew and, and the paths diverge, right? And some people mm -hmm. end up here and some people don't. And I, I always, I always tell people the degrees of separation are very, very thin. So, uh, you know, it, it doesn't take much of a difference from one to the other. So uh, you can't take any of it for granted. And I think that attitude of gratitude is so important. Mm, interesting. Uh, I reconnected recently with um, friends from early in my career and uh, just had lunch the other day with one that hadn't seen in 25 years. And uh, but there's something about uh, having that same the same roots and the you know, we, we both were talking about how much we learned in that first uh, first jobs and just we knew what we had built on. And uh, there were, there's a lot to be said for that, for that bonding. Mm -hmm. um, one of the thoughts that I had on there was, um, well, one of my little disagreements, um, he mentioned that um, the two motivators for everyone are love and love and money. And mm -hmm. that's not what the research says. So it's not a research book, but um, it's money's never at the top of the list, especially for intrinsic or for long term. Um, but he did talk about it a lot. And I, I like that he said um, money can rent loyalty, but it can't buy it. So the, the point about gratitude for leaders is um, in addition to what we talked about. But the point is that you show gratitude to your people, that you appreciate them. And he talks throughout the whole book about leaders don't go it alone. So uh, one time he said the players win the games you know, not the coach or the G GM's back in the suite. He's not the one winning the games, you know, so thinking about the chiefs. Um, so the um, paying attention to your people and showing the, um, the um, recognition of their contribution and uh, making sure they feel that was his main point there. But it brought up a story that I remember um, happening several years ago when um, the annual awards were going to be presented. And so they um, told the group, uh, four or five people that were getting these big awards, but they told them ahead of time in private. So they had the, the manager, the director, the executive VP, and maybe the president too. And um, so there were, you know, 10, 12 people in this room and the big boardroom. It's kind of intimidating and people don't go, you know, lower level people don't go in there all the time. And, um, but this person told me this story about when she went in there, um, the executives, the VP was super friendly, even the one of the other division, super friendly and nice and congratulated her, um, you know, told her the, you know, what the announcement was and uh, very happy. But her, the director, her skip level boss, never spoke to her, never said her name, never congratulated her, never said a thing. Yeah, Dave, I saw your reaction there. Like, isn't that something? Yeah. And so that's, that's the part that struck what struck her the whole time. So there, you know, a week or two later, there was the all hands meeting and all of the employees got to recognize them and cheer and everything. And all of that was touching. And like, there was a bonus and a plaque and stuff. But she remembered that director did not even speak to her. And there were only 10 or 12 people in the room. It wasn't like 
200. Yeah. So yeah, that demotivated her and she ended up leaving like within six months. Wow. But so, well, we just talked about it. They, people will long remember how you made them feel. That's that, right. You just illustrated the point. That's right. Even in the midst of this great benefit, you know, great gift of gratitude, of um, the opportunity to show gratitude and the leader screwed it up. You know, yeah. So it's harder than you think sometimes, I guess, or, but so do better than that leaders out there. Pay attention to your people. That's the point on this. Okay, let's go to our resilience was next. Um, Brett, do you want to go first on this one? Sure. I, I had just two bullet points on this one. And because and, and I saved a lot of mine for empathy, but uh, the two I really call it here, overcoming adversary. And there's a story that he writes about a guy who went for an interview and you, oh you can God. just, you could, you couldn't help but laugh. No, oh, yeah, was awesome. I, I, I'll paraphrase it really quickly, but the guy hadn't tried on his suit in some time, went to put it on. It didn't fit. And uh, so he, and then I think he lost his keys or something. And so he's running across campus, doesn't have the right clothes. He ends up borrowing a suit and tie from somebody he sees. And then he ends up borrowing a bicycle from somebody to get to the interviewer. And he goes into the interview somewhat disheveled and, and, obviously discombobulated and you would expect he's going to lose the interview. And he goes on to explain why he is, you know, in the condition that he is. And the inventor says, you know, anybody who would put that much effort and energy into the job obviously shows a high level of initiative and ingenuity and he got the job. So yeah. like I said, I, I don't know anybody personally who's went through that, but uh, it was a heck of a story, whether it's true or not, I, I'll never know. The, the other point that I had under resilience, he, he he kind of steals a little bit from Carol Dweck, I felt, about the growth mindset and, you know, this idea of being having a positive outlook. And I really enjoyed that. But this is that idea, you know, when things get you down and you run into some tough sledding, you know, having a growth mindset is what's going to see you through. And it's always interesting to me how two people can have the same exact situation mm -hmm. and just simply the lens by which they choose to view the situation will often dictate the outcome. And like I said, I paraphrase and quote Dr. Yeah. Dwight all the time because I'm yeah. such a big fan of that growth mindset and it's on my top 10 list of books mm -hmm. to read. Amazing. Those are my two for resilience. Um, while you mention your top 10 books, the website um, voyagecg.com slash leadership books has a handout for today. So it has the book's name, the book name and the link to the book on it as well. Um, so that's why I put that up there. So that handout is available for anybody. Um, Dave, thoughts on resilience? Yeah, that, that same story, Brent, really jumped out at me too. And, you know, kind of what it, it reminded me of as well was um, years ago, I, uh, I went into a, a retail establishment on a Sunday. And it was actually a, a place I worked at when I was a, a teenager. And uh, Sunday afternoon, the place wasn't very busy. There were two, two guys in there working that were, you know, looked to be, you know, late teenagers. And uh, as I walked up to the counter, the, the guy had a, a, a printed essay in front of him that looked very much like, you know, a college student's essay. And he saw me coming and he quickly shoved it aside. And, and I said, what are you working on there? And he said, oh, I, it's a paper I have to write for my comp one class um, at, at Metropolitan Community College. And I said, oh, OK. I said, well, what are you writing about? So he told me and and I went to pay and I opened my wallet and he saw my school faculty ID and he said, wait a minute, you're, you're a teacher. And I said, yeah. And he, he looked at me and he, he grabs his paper and he pulls it back over. And he said, would you mind reading my paper? And I said, well, well, sure. Give me a pen. So I, I took his paper and I stepped to the side of the counter and I, I took about 20 minutes and I marked up his paper and I came back over once the next customer walked away. And I just kind of quickly went through the paper and said, here's what I would change. And here's things you need to do. And the other kid that was in there work and just stopped and looked at me and he goes, why on earth did you take 30 minutes out of your day to sit here and read this guy's paper just because, and I looked at him and, and, and I, I couldn't believe it just came to me. I said, because he asked, wow. and said, if, if you don't ask the, the answer is no. And you know, that, that story kind of came back to me about, you know, resilience of, you know, this kid was like, hey, here I am trying to work, you know, earn my way through college. I'm working on this paper. And he just took a gamble and said, hey, I, I see you're a professor. Would you read wow. it for me and, and edit it? And, you know, meanwhile, I, you know, I told my wife, oh, I'm just running down the street. I'll be right back. I come back much <laughs> later than what I intended. And she's like, where, where have you been? And I said, uh, thing, you know, this, this kid asked me to read his paper and she's what? And I said, what? I know I said I'd hire him in a heartbeat. Yeah. I said, you wow. Know, to take that kind of action and initiative just really mm -hmm. kind, of, kind of got to me. And I've been telling that story for years now. 
That's a great As you should, Dave. That's a fantastic <laughs> story. And the, the thing that was resonating as I was listening to you was in all of that story, you didn't mention yourself until you got to the correcting of the paper. Everything was about that person. And I mean, it kind of goes with the theme, but you were so focused on on him and, and really giving of yourself. So kudos to you. You're really demonstrating all these characteristics. I think it's great. Yeah, I love that. Um, because he asked, I love that. Um, disagreement when I did disagree a little bit here, uh, where he made it sound like resilience was making it through and, you know, um, determination and perseverance and getting through the adversity coming out of the fog he talks about. But um, I've done a lot of research on resilience and it's being better than you were on the out on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So that's resilience that you're and then having that faith when you're going into the hardship that mm -hmm. I've been here before, I've done hard things before. So I know I will be better on the other side. That's what resilience is. And I loved that he had that. I turned it into a scale where he had, um, you know, life isn't always a sprint. Sometimes it's a marathon. Sometimes it's an Ironman. And I thought sometimes it's a stroll in the park. Sometimes, you know, like if you think about the, the um, challenges that you have, and like, where would I be on that walk from stroll in the park to Ironman? Where mm -hmm. is it? And then you can anticipate yeah. the challenges and maybe not get so freaked out and be re more resilient, you know, and then if you, these are also kind of a process. So if you have gratitude, you have that kind of a mindset and build relationships with people in that way. Um, then you're resilient, you're, um, you know, not as um, thrown off by challenges. And then the next one is the aspiration, A, G, R, A, aspiration. So aspiration was the knowledge that we can make tomorrow better than today. And it's giving hope and um, showing people that having a vision and, and giving people hope. Um, I just loved all of that. So Dave, do you want to start us on this one? Yeah, again, uh, I'll, I'll kind of steal uh, Brett's tactics here is, you know, being a, a girl dad myself, you know, I'm always trying to look for those life lessons to, to teach my daughter. And uh, one thing I always tell my daughter is uh, everybody can teach you something. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes they might teach you what you don't want to be, how you don't want to act or, you know, that sort of thing. But you can almost always, you know, learn something from from everybody. And when I was reading this section of the book, what kind of jumped out at me about aspiration uh, for people uh, pretty early in my career, I got a, a heck of a wake up call um, from an intern that we had hired, a, a college level intern that came mm -hmm. in. He was a wonderful individual, had uh, you know performed very well in the few weeks he had, he had been within the organization. And we were coming back from uh, the, the uh, on site uh, you know food court. And we look up and the, the COO of the company is coming the opposite direction. And, you know, at, at that time in my career, I was I was the type where I would maybe say hello. But uh, if they were going the opposite way and didn't bother me, um, hello would be about all I would say. And uh, this intern's walking with me. He sees the COO come in the opposite direction. And uh, I said, hey, that's that's so and so that's that's the COO. I said, we're going to say hello. I said, you know, in your mind, have a little elevator pitch ready. But he usually doesn't stop people. So we get up to this individual. My intern stops him, introduces himself and says, I want to be a COO one day. And one of these days, um, I would love it if I could sit down with you and uh, pick your brain a little bit, but also share some ideas I have uh, on the company. And I'm, I'm sitting there, my head's about to explode going, well, this could be this guy's last day at work because wow. the intern told the COO, um, I want to sit down and tell you some things. And, and there was this what seemed like a very long silence. And finally, the COO said, well, why don't you send my admin an email and uh, let's you and I do lunch. And he ended up getting to have lunch with the COO and, and he came back from lunch and I'm going, oh man, oh man, oh man. And I said, well, how did it go? And he goes, well, he told me he'd hire me full time once I graduate college. And I said, oh, okay, all right. tell me all these stories that uh, he shared with the COO. So I was like, wow, uh, this kid, you know, really aspires uh, for greatness and, and he's going to get there. So awesome. uh, that's what I thought about when I, I read that chapter of the book. So, yeah, I love that he knew what he wanted to do. Yeah, yep. absolutely. Yeah. Like in the uh, students in my um, professional development, contemplation and action class that do the strategic career management framework. Yep. So and clients that have done that as well. Brett, what about you for aspiration? 
I had a couple points. The first one that he made a point about being in motion and the story was about going for a Sunday drive. I, I won't, we're running tight on time. I won't yeah. illustrate that one, but this idea of motion, you know, goes back to my bike riding story. And then uh, he had another point in there says, we're only as good as our last promise kept, which I really liked. Yeah. Uh, there, there's two other points. My youngest daughter is, is somewhat a perfectionist. And as a result, she, she struggles a little bit with anxiety. And, and he, he talked a little bit about anxiety there in, in the quote that I wrote. And, I, and when I sent this in the little email I mentioned earlier, I highlighted it and bolded it, underlined it. And I said, anxiety is an energy spent without a goal. Yeah. And, and I, I Allie, you, know, you did. Yeah. Yeah. And she, Allie responded back to me, you know, and she said, you know, that there's some truth in that. Yeah. And and I think I, there's another one about time wasted is this time you'll never get back. And then anxiety and stress is, is basically paying a tax for a bill that's never going to come. So I, I really re kind of hooked onto that and shared that with her. Um, the, the other last point under aspiration that I got is he had this uh, story in there about a calming voice, just the simply the words, it will be okay. Mm. And, you know, you think of people like mm. EMTs and firefighters and police officers, you know, and they've all said that it's going to be okay. And there's something about that calming voice, that sense of reassurance that, you know, takes some anxiety and stress and tension, you know, out of, out of us. I, I can't explain why that is, but just simply, mm -hmm. you know, that, that, that calming assurance of somebody in, a position of authority or strength or knowledge telling us, you know what, you know, you're going to make it. It's going to be OK. I, uh, I, I've been in more than one instance where those words were, were just enough to kind of get me through onto the other side and onto a better place. So uh, those were the three things that I pulled out of that section. Yeah. And people look to the leader during uh, difficult times and during challenges and absolutely they look to the leader in a bear market or a bull market. And that he talked about that. Yeah. And they look to the leader for hope and grace and the leader needs to be a real leader and not be freaking out about the changes that's happening and pa panicking and sharing all of that, but really focused on moving forward. Okay, let's go into courage. So we could talk about that one all day as well. Um, so courage, the ability to understand, understand and move beyond our fears. So not just to overlook the fears. I, I appreciated his perspective on that. Mm -hmm. um, and this one was where Carol Dweck came to mind for me. Um, this was my third li minor little disagreement because he says somewhere in there about learning agility is the number one predictor of success. I think he was trying to get to um, to grit, maybe with um, Angela Duckworth's thoughts. So um, maybe with grit, but certainly her Duckworth's research about grit. And then um, a Chicago Booth professor, his was all about how you use your network. And I've forgotten his name right now, but his was his number one predictor of success is um, how you use your network. And then Carol Dweck is your attitude and mindset to growth. So I thought that was another thing that he said. I didn't want people to have the wrong, wrong impression of what that is or how that would affect them. Um, and then again, talking about um, never walking alone. I think that's part of what he came, where he came from or where that was included in the book too. Well, that was one of my points as well, that we're, we're not meant to walk alone and relying yeah. on others, which is your community, your network. I had a note here, glass half empty or glass half full, which is the mm -hmm. growth mindset. And then the other point I made, Kelly, was uh, giving energy or taking energy. And, and I've always said, you know, it's amazing how you can be in a room with a negative person and the energy just comes out of the room. Right. And, and you be in a room with a positive person and the, the whole room's alive. And, and yeah. obviously you know, we all know this, right? I mean, negative people are drawn to negative people and positive people are drawn to positive people. And, you know, if you're, you never want to be the smartest person in the room, but obviously you never want to be the negative person in the room. Right. Surround yourself by people that give you energy and, uh, and you'll be much better for it. Mm -hmm. And that, um, but it's not positive for this, like La La Land or whatever, like the um, whistling zippity doo -dah all day long, but positive moving forward. Courage well, to move you know, forward. This is courage, and I think you can yeah. tie aspiration and yeah. you know, aspiration, yeah, inspiration, that. courage. It's it's yeah. these people that that us that inspire you to uh, go yeah. above and beyond. Yeah, Dave, want to chime in on courage? Yeah, just you know, real quick, I, I kind of thought you know, like old school John Wayne quote, you know, something to the effect of you know, courage is being scared to death but saddling up anyway. <laughs> and, you know, more modern. You know, I, I'd go back on the example Brett told about his daughter going into this, you know, IT security event. You know, I don't know anybody, maybe a little bit of fear of going up and talking to somebody. And, mm -hmm. you know, you use the expression, you know, 
be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I think modern day, you know, when we think about courage, that's one thing that, you know, I talk to a lot of students about is, you know, hey, there's going to be a, you know, I'm, I'm really involved in the healthcare IT Kansas City chapter. And, you know, I see people that come to these meetings and you can tell they don't know anybody and they kind of stand back. They've got their name tag on. They're kind of looking, going, when's the bar going to open? When are the hors d'oeuvres going to be ready? Don't make me socialize with somebody I don't know. Right. So I think modern day, it's not saddle up and go into battle modern day it's how do i get the courage to approach that person that i have no idea who they are strike up a conversation and work to build and grow my network mm -hmm. it's a great point yeah Dave. that is that's really good i think there's um so many of the points in the book can be related to how we are at work and how we are outside of work and it's just the truth of who we are and so would you know how do you approach anyone and the commonality that you have as people and just care about people and show that you're interested and curious, all the things. Okay, let's get to empathy. And uh, the last one. So we should have started there probably. <laughs> um, empathy, he's, he um, defines it and says the, um, where did I put my note? The understanding needed to connect with others from their perspective understanding others from their perspective. All right, Brett, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, as I read empathy, and, and again, I'm going back to what I typed to Allie, I, I'm pretty good at a lot of what I do. And boy, if there's one of these graces that I have room to improve on, it's empathy. And, and I looked up the opposite or, you know, the, the uh, I, I forget the word, but uh, the opposite of empathetic is being a, a narcissist, right? And I said, you know, where do I, you know, you were talking about your continuum uh, yeah. on your walks, Kelly. And I'm thinking to myself, where do I fall? And I'm, I don't want to say I'm a narcissist, but I'm probably closer to that end of the continuum than I am empathy. And obviously this book is about the, the leadership graces of good leaders. Right. And I thought to myself, if I'm going to define myself and label myself as a good leader, I really have got some room for improvement about empathy. And he talks a little about, about diversity and inclusion and, and understand meeting your employees and your, your subordinates where they are listening. And granted, you don't have to be weak. You don't have to, uh, you know, you don't have to say yes to everything, but just simply relating to people. And, and again, as I literally, as I read every section under empathy, the one thing I kept telling myself is, oh my gosh, I've really got a long way to go. So in the interest of time, I won't share, you know, every little thing I've got written down, but just my point to everybody. And Kelly was talking about initially at her age, she's still learning at my age. I'm still learning. And I've identified again by reading this book mm -hmm. that here's a weakness of mine that I need to improve on to make myself a better leader. Yeah. And that's the thing right now is what, what people want in the workplace is that connection and they okay. want that sincerity, um, that care, that, uh, that empathy. And that's uh, leaders that don't get that are, um, are going to be dinosaurs soon enough. Cause that's what the employees are saying. You know, that's what they're responding to. Dave, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, boy, Brett, I was glad to hear you say that because uh, I, I stink at it too. Um, you know, I, I was very fortunate in my career to be promoted into a leadership, you know, management position at, at a very young age. And uh, if any anybody is on here listening that I managed early in my career, I'm sorry. Um, you know, I, I was I was very young. I, I was married, but didn't didn't have a you know child in the house at the time. Um, and you know, I was managing people that had small children at home. Some of them were caring for elderly parents, um, single parents, all of the above. And I was incredibly not empathetic because I didn't know I hadn't been in those situations. And it wasn't until years later I had a child and had to deal with a sick kid, even years later, uh, dealing with, you know, being responsible for helping to provide care for grandparents and parents as they aged and mm -hmm. something I had never experienced. And I found myself looking back and going, wow, you know, I managed so-and-so as they were going through that. Did I do the best job I could have of being empathetic to their needs? And, and the answer is no. And if they, they're listening right now, they're shaking their heads going, yeah, you really stunk at that. Um, so I, I have a lot of work to do there. Uh, I don't think I'll ever be done. Um, I hope I get better at it as, as time goes on. So yeah, I really enjoyed that chapter as well. Yeah, I thought I could do better too when he talked about three different kinds of empathy and we won't go into them all because of time, but there's three different kinds. It's not just listening. 
you know, mm-hmm. that and you need to do all three of those at different times in different situations. So I thought, oh, that's a good way to to improve. And yeah. I'll apologize to the team that reported to me when I was right out of undergrad as well. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember my boss had to take me aside and said, uh, "This Lynn does not want to be CEO of this company." I was like, what? She's like 56, retired, just doing this, you know, to have something to be connected with us. And I was like, she doesn't? Like, what do you mean? He had to like literally, literally explain it to me. Like, no, not everybody wants to, you know, go that route. I was like, oh, okay. Like rock stars versus superstars, Kim's got Right, right. <laughs> yeah, that was good. Um, Let's see. And the other thing on empathy. Oh, I loved how he worded um, something with he talked in this chapter a lot about culture. And that's a lot of the work that I do inside companies. And um, I don't ask the employees when I work with companies, I don't usually say, um, do you like the culture here? But I'll say, um, what is it like to work here? And tell me what it's like to work here. And he talked about that as well. That's how you get some good insights. So there's a good phrase for everybody out there. What's what's it like? The, what's what was it like this week, or what's it like to work there? Um, those are good. Um, okay, any last minute? We are way over our thirty minute time frame, but it was so good. <laughs> Wait, I, you know, I, I just had a summary statement here, and I just said, you know, yeah. I, I didn't have high expectations going into this book. You know, as Kelly said, it's a coffee table book, and oftentimes they're just they're 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 decorative. Yeah. But I got a whole lot more out of it than I expected. And and if anybody's contemplating reading the book. All I could say is take your time. You know, this is one of those books, you know, that's not, in my opinion, meant to be read cover to cover in one sitting. Take your time, savor each story, reflect, uh, determine where you can improve, how it impacts you and those around you. But, uh, you know, again, we, I, my top 10 has now become a top 20. So and this is yeah. definitely <laughs> this is definitely in there. I'll, I'll, I really, really appreciate it and, and value the time I invested in this book. And I'm sure everybody else will as well. I yeah. love it. Dave, any final thoughts? Yeah, just again, great great book. I know we're over time, so I highly recommend it. Re- really enjoyed it as well. So um, definitely pick it up. And I do see Andrew Ellenberg. I see you, and um, I see your comments. I can't see you, but I see your comments. And the um, differences between empathy and sympathy, how he described it. Um, sympathy is a kind of empathy. He calls it emotional empathy. And that's when you feel... Um, You feel others, um, you feel others pain. And he says, um, but sometimes we do that to the degree that we feel and care so much. So I'm going to put up barriers because I don't have the capacity for that right now. And I I caught myself in that lately. Uh, I don't have my, I don't have the capacity to care about new people. So I don't want to go to any networking things because then I'll care about them. So we put up these barriers and then those barriers end up, um, preventing us from having compassion for people. So Andrew, thank you for the question. And uh, thanks for uh, for joining us today. Uh, my last thought was that um, how he talks about that you have to know yourself first and remember you're um, not a sculptor working alone. It's leadership is all about the other people. So um, he gives a lot of great advice for that. So thank you for joining us today. Um, our next conversation is November 17th. So it's not the last week of the month because of the Thanksgiving holiday. And um, we have to have our conversation about the book. So I'll post about it and uh, tell you what the book is when we have that figured out in the next few days. And um, I think that is it for announcements. So do we have our title for next month, Kelly? No, we need to. Yeah, I need to look at that still. Okay, great. So, yeah, so we'll post about it whenever we very good. So we figure it out. So thank you. Thank you both. Thanks for uh, the conversation and enlightenment and the insights. Thanks, thank everybody. You much. Thank you all for joining us today. We'll go. <clears throat>